Pakistan, a country with a rich diversity of people and languages. But this multicultural society is being plagued by increasing sectarian violence. Sectarian violence is at its peak right now. Civilians, police and the military have all been victims of deadly attacks. If you ask me as to the number of problems, the sky is the limit. We are in an absolute mess. If the authorities do not tackle this problem, then they are, we're, we're moving towards the direction of a broader tension and breakdown in the society. Both Shias and Sunnis have been killed. With Shia Muslims bearing the brunt of the violence from bombings to targeted killings. We deserve, we have the right to be an equal citizen of Pakistan. I'm Yarba Moham. On this edition of 101 East, we ask, can a newly elected Pakistani government protect its minorities? And if so, how? Karachi, known as Mini Pakistan, a vibrant city, it's also one of the most dangerous in the world, with rampant gun crime, sky-high homicide rates, and growing sectarian conflict from both Sunnis and Shias. And these are the men tasked to protect it. Karachi's counter-terror unit battles ordinary crime on top of the challenge of facing some of the world's most notorious armed groups. We're on patrol with the people who probably have the toughest job in the city. Every day an average of about six people are killed in Karachi alone. Imran Shalkat is the spokesperson for the Karachi Police Force. He says they're fighting a war at home. Definitely we are fighting the war in forefront. There are several different types of violence going on, or which I would term as terrorism. There's terrorism against law enforcement agencies. Then there is uh, another type where there are political workers that are being targeted. Then there is another type where there are sectarian people belonging to a different sect, they're being targeted. And then when they're targeted, uh, people from that sect go and target uh, as a revenge to the other sect. It's been a bloody year of sectarian violence in Pakistan. Several bomb blasts and attacks claimed by armed pro-Sunni groups have rocked the city of Quetta, targeting mostly the Shia Hazara community, killing hundreds, injuring dozens more, and leaving its citizens terrorized. In recent years, attacks against Hazaras has been getting worse, more frequent, more people dying. Uh, from about 2010 up till now, every year seems to be getting worse. Mustafa Kadri from rights group Amnesty International is taking me to a neighborhood in Karachi where Hazaras from Quetta have sought refuge. Is the Hazara community vulnerable? Oh, it's intensely vulnerable. Uh, you know, we obviously cover the, all, all of Pakistan and we haven't found a community more targeted, uh, more traumatised than the Hazara community. There are just over half a million Hazaras in a country of 180 million. Most Hazaras live in the resource-rich province of Baluchistan, Pakistan's largest. Ethnically Mongolian, they're easily identifiable from the rest of the population. If you're a Hazara today in Quetta, you know you stand out. You know that even if you're a little child, a boy or a girl, you could be fair game for one of these groups. So you can't just wander the streets. Um, they have to stay barricaded in their communities. 
And yet this year especially, even those communities have been bombed. And literally, it seems that there's no place that's safe for Hazara. <laughs> Kadri is documenting testimony from Hazaras that have fled Quetta. Arif tells me he felt he had no choice but to bring his family to Karachi. He shows me photos of his niece, who was killed along with other family in a blast in February. His sister, his sister, Others have come to Karachi seeking treatment. Uh, he is, uh, my father is a bomb blast victim. He was injured in the 16th February 2013 this year, I mean. Sultan Ali was severely injured when the blast went off in a busy market in Quetta, just metres from where he was operating a vegetable store. His son Salman found his father after an anxious wait, but feared the worst. I went to hospital. After eight hours, I found my father. Suddenly, I called my mom. But he is fine. But he was unconscious at that moment. He was, he was, he was waking up and sleeping, waking up. He couldn't talk. He couldn't, you know, even he couldn't recognize me at that time. Despite the flight of Hazaras from Quetta to Karachi. Even here, some of its most high-profile members are being targeted. My grandfather, General Musa Khan, who was the Commander-in-Chief of Pakistan Army, and uh, from 1958 to 1966, and then he was Governor of West Pakistan. This is the highest military medal that you can get if you're alive, if you're not martyred in a war. Sadar Mehdi Musa is a former minister for Baluchistan and a Hazara tribal chief whose family has a long and proud history serving Pakistan. He says his community's only crime is its religion. Just because of Shias, what else could it be? Why would anybody kill a person who buys vegetables and sell them for his livelihood? Or a worker who's working in a mine? How else can you describe this? He says his father was killed by a pro-Sunni sectarian group. My father uh, was murdered in Karachi by lashkar e -Jangi. What would it make me feel like? I was threatened and attacked. My house was attacked with a hand grenade. After so many years of uh, serving this nation for over three generations. Feels bad. All of the attacks against Hazaras in Quetta this year have been claimed by the banned pro-Sunni armed group lashkar e -Jangvi, or LEJ, including this one in February, where it reportedly said it would turn Baluchistan into a Shia graveyard. And it's not just bomb blasts. This video, purported to have been released by the LEJ two years ago, shows its fighters pulling Hazara pilgrims off a bus as they travel to Iran. At least 26 people were found dead. Here, one of its former leaders, Malik Ishaq, outlines its anti-Iran and anti-Shia agenda. <laughs> Ishaq was arrested after Quetta's February attack. He's since been appointed a vice president of Ahl Sunnat Wal Jamaat, 
a Sunni political party that has historical ties to Lashkar-e Jangvi. Now, what are those links? Uh, certainly, it is the leadership, it's the ideology, um, it is the fact that um, you know you'll have the leadership of ASWJ supporting statements and acts of Lashkar-e Jangvi, um, and basically their objective is to rid Pakistan of the Shia population. We're on our way to see the group's chief in Karachi. He lives in a high security compound in a slum on the city's outskirts. Maulana Aurangzeb Faruqi is heavily guarded. He tells me his party is not linked to Lashkar-e Jangvi. یعنی ان کی ہر چیز ہم سے مختلف ہے اور علیحدہ ہے اور ہم سے باغی ہیں اسی وجہ سے بغاوت کی ہے کہ ہم ملک میں دہشت گردی نہیں چاہتے اور وہ لوگ کہتے ہیں کہ جب آپ کے مطالبات نہیں مانے جاتے تو آپ بزور بازو منوائیں ہم کہتے ہیں بات مذاکرات سے منوائی جاتی ہے بات کلاشن سے بات ہتھیار سے مسلح کوششوں سے نہیں منوائی جاتی اس لیے وہ ہم سے علیحدہ ہوئے اور ہمارا ان پہ کوئی کنٹرول نہیں ہے ان کی علیحدہ جماعت ہے اور ہماری علیحدہ جماعت ہے Would you say you have the same ideology? Ha. Anti Shia hone mein to hum mein koi ikhtilaf nahi hai. Maulana Faruqi says that Ishaq has renounced violence and is no longer part of the armed pro Sunni group. What sort of a message is your party sending by recruiting someone like Malik Ishaq who was a leader of the LEJ who's claimed a responsibility for attacks against Shias, brutal attacks in Quetta? ان سے یہ عہد لیا گیا کہ وہ آئندہ ایسی کاروائیوں میں ملوث نہیں ہوں گے بلکہ جس طرح ہم پرامن جد و جہد کر رہے ہیں اسی طرح وہ بھی پرامن جد و جہد کریں گے بٹ صدر مہدی موسا سیز برنگنگ ملک از حق ان ٹو دا گروپس فولڈ از پروف آف اٹس لنکس وتھ لشکر جنگوی وائف دے میڈ ہیم دیر وائس پریزیڈنٹ سیم پیپل سیم فیسز ڈفرنٹ نیم Amar Latif is a political analyst who believes Pakistan is increasingly becoming the battleground in a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Here every day we hear about uh, sectarian killings and just in today's newspaper you see one Sunni activist killed and one Shia activist killed. Uh, sectarian violence in one way or the other is being uh, fueled by the two countries, by the Saudi Arabia and by the Iran. The, Saudi, uh, the Sunni hardliners are, are being funded by Saudi Arabia and the Shia hardliners are being funded by Iran. Definitely there are foreign, uh, foreign hands, foreign forces involved in it, or foreign factors involved in it. Uh, fundings and everything and uh, but the worst thing that is uh, the people from our own nation uh, get used and they come and they execute the police say they've uncovered disturbing evidence of groups working to create anarchy and unrest in the country there were 91 target killings uh, from both sects uh, that were done from the same one pistol We had uh, the empties recovered from the crime scene. There were 91 murders, sectarian, maybe uh, about 41 were Shiites and about 50 were Sunnis. They were carried out by the same one gun. Both the Sunni Lashkar-e Jangvi and Ahl Sunnat Wal Jamaat blame Iran for the sectarian violence in Pakistan. Mulana Faruqi says Iran is supporting Shia groups here like the Majlis e Wahdat Muslimin. Iran brahrast Pakistan ke tamam mamlaat mein mulawis hai jo Balochistan ke raste se aur apne safarkhanon ke zariye se yahan ki Wahdat ul Muslimin hai jise Iran support kar rahi hai. 
the largely Shia neighborhood of Abbas town bears party slogans of the Majlas i Wahdat Muslimin, with praise of Iran's Ayatollah. Sabir Kabbalah says his party is not anti Sunni and blames America and Israel for the sectarian violence. They want to clash Shia with Sunni in every street of across the Pakistan. So you're saying this is an external plot? This yes. is not coming from Pakistanis? No. Like Quetta, this Karachi neighborhood has seen violence. Just this March, a bomb went off in Abbas town. About 50 people were killed and dozens more injured. Buildings flattened. The blast in Abbas town was so strong that it badly damaged the two apartment blocks that were once here. While reconstruction is taking place, there's still a lot more work to be done to reconcile the community. The Shia graveyard on the outskirts of Karachi is the resting place for many who were killed in the bombing. 14-year-old Hamza Zaidi became the patriarch of his family too early. His family visit the graves of Hamza's father and older brother. His mother Najis touching the earth to communicate with the dead. Najis says her family is in ruins, their future uncertain. एक इतना बड़ा सानिहा जिसका हम सोच भी नहीं सकते थे हमारी तो जिंदगी के बारे में बड़ी-बड़ी प्लानिंग्स थी अपने बच्चों के लिए जब ये सुना मैंने तो कुछ भी नहीं रहा बाकी और जिंदगी में वाकई कुछ नहीं रहा नाजस tells me her husband Iqbal was a religious man devoted to his family who ran a gift shop in the markets in Abbas town their 16-year-old son, Al Tayif, was helping him in the shop on the day of the blast. My son was very loved, he was very loved, he was very loved, he was very loved, and he was very loved, he was very loved, he was very loved. और मेरा हेल्पर था कहा जाए घर घर के अंदर छोटे मोटे जब मैं काम करती थी तो वो मेरे कामों में हाथ बटाता था न जाने मैं दिन में कितनी दफा इस तस्वीर के आगे खड़े हो के बातें करती हूँ अपने शोहर से भी अपने बेटे से भी No one has claimed responsibility for the attack in the predominantly Shia neighborhood. Police say the blast's aim was to set off a spiral of violence. It was an act of terrorism done by some specific group just to create hatred uh, amongst these two sects so there would be more attacks. It was just they wanted to trigger a reaction that they would come and do the first blast and then maybe some Shiites would get up and do it on the Sunnis and who would do it in response to Shiites. The Sunni community too has fallen victim to sectarian violence, often in reprisal attacks after Shia killings. The sort of upscale in violence, we're now seeing that is increasing amongst the Shia population as well. That they are now creating these armed groups that are also implicated in attacks on the Sunnis. It's a tragic reality for Aliyah Farid. Her husband and three of his brothers were killed in a motorcycle drive-by on their way home from work last September. Alia tells me her oldest son still has nightmares and often asks her if someone will kill him too because he's Sunni. She says she doesn't know who was behind the attack, 
but that her family's affiliation with the ASWJ might have led to the targeted killing. A new government was elected in May. In the capital Islamabad, Interior Minister Shaudri Nisa Ali Khan is holding his first press conference since forming government. The minister tells the packed room he's formulating a new national security policy and a task force that will make Pakistan's numerous security agencies work together. There's, there's a lot of uh, distortion, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of lack of coordination between our security agencies, between our security agencies and the intelligence agencies, between the security agencies and the provincial government, between the provincial government and the federal government. So first and foremost, we have to set our house in order. We are in a state of war, and yet there is utter confusion about chain, chain of command, about the authority, about the ownership of policies. But it's not just coordination that Amnesty International's Mustafa Qadri says is needed. Uh, what particularly concerns us is the fact that these attacks seem to happen with impunity, that those who commit them can literally get away with murder. And um, as far as we are aware, uh, none of those actually involved in these attacks have been brought to justice in a fair trial. Uh, what sort of conviction rate do you have at the moment? It's shamefully low. Only in the past one year, 2012, we had over 2,000 people killed in the city. Uh, we had over 200 target killers arrested red-handed last year. And so far, we have not been able to get a single conviction on that. We are in an absolute mess. Uh, so right from intelligence gathering to intelligence sharing, reaction to a certain incident, uh, taking up the challenge once an incident takes place, it's a long process, but I assure you, we have the will and the experience and the commitment to pick up the pieces and carry this country forward, inshallah. So you're optimistic? I'm optimistic. My message is peace. Nobody can impose their vision, their ideology, their thinking through a barrel of gun. It doesn't happen. It backfires. The blowback is too hot. I want every mother to feel safe, sending their kids out. I want economic activity here. It's, people are energetic, people are, uh, they have their dreams. And I hope as a police officer, we can give them surroundings that they can fulfill their dreams. Each loved one can go back to their loved ones every evening. With the security of families, communities, and the social fabric of the nation at stake, Pakistan's authorities can ill afford not to act to protect and create a safe environment for all of its citizens.